All right, so welcome to today's pocket lecture. We're going to give two really brief presentations. Um, my name is Kate and we also have Michelle here. Um, I'm going to start first with a little one about Mary Anning and fossil hunting and then I'll hand it to Michelle who's going to be doing a short little baseball presentation. Um, and after this is done, we will also um, have them recorded and we'll post them up to our YouTube page. Um, and at the end of this month, we should have the complete four part series um, of staff member interest and in random knowledge. Um, so I'm going to dive into this one, my presentation on Mary Anning and fossil hunting on the Jurassic Coast. Um, so first, what and where is the Jurassic Coast? So it is a stretch of shoreline about 95 miles long that runs between the counties of Dorset and Devon in southwest England. Um, and what makes it special is the geology. It's made up of really big cliffs, really small cliffs, lots of rocky beaches, um, and all of those things are really good representations of the Triassic, Jurassic, and early Cretaceous periods from the Mesozoic era. So it's a hotbed for fossil hunting and has been very important for fossil research. Um, it's also a really beautiful place with the big cliffs overlooking the ocean. Um, it was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2001. It's actually the only natural World Heritage Site in all of England. All the rest of the ones in England are man-made. Um, and the UK government has designated it as an area of outstanding natural beauty. One figure that's closely associated with the Jurassic Coast is Mary Anning. Uh, Mary Anning is a woman who was born in 1799 and she has been called the greatest fossilist the world ever knew. Um, she was born in Lyme Regis in Dorset, which is right in the heart of the Jurassic Coast region, and she was born to a relatively poor family. They ran a shop um, where they sold shells and fossils to tourists and collectors, which meant that Mary and her family were down on the beaches and in the cliffs collecting those things to sell. Um, unfortunately, her father died in 1810 when Mary was about 11, um, but she and her brother and her mother carried on that business with Mary doing a lot of the work of going to excavate fossils out of those cliffs in order to sell them. And through that hands-on work, she really developed sharp skills in excavation and identification of these fossils. And she started making pretty big discoveries fairly early on in her life. Um, the first of which was the ichthyosaur. Mary Anning in 1810 and 1811 excavated the world's first complete ichthyosaur skeleton. Um, she and her brother found it poking out of the cliffs um, nearby Lyme Regis. And Mary was the one who did the excavating. Um, she did go on to find a few more ichthyosaur um, skeletons. The one pictured as her first one. I remember she was only about 11 or 12 when they did this. Um, so this was a really big find. It's now in the Oxford Natural History Museum. Um, another one of her more major discoveries was the first complete plesiosaurus skeleton, which she found in 1823, also on the Jurassic Coast. Um, the picture you see is her sketch of the fossil bones and some of her notes. And another one of her major discoveries was the first pterosaur, or as we know now called a pterodactyl, that was found outside of Germany. They had found them in Germany, but they hadn't seen them anywhere else. And Mary found the first one outside of Germany in 1828. The picture you're looking at now is held in the Natural History Museum of London's collections. Um, so these are three of her larger finds, but she was extremely prolific. She found a lot of marine fossils. She developed expertise in excavation of them and identification of them, and she developed a particular expertise in what are called coprolites. Sounds a little bit gross, but they're fossilized droppings, um, and she was the first one to really take a look at those and go inside of them, um, which helped further the knowledge of the diet of these animals, whether they were omnivores, carnivores, herbivores, things like that. Um, and so she really became an expert in her time. Uh, so what happened to her and to her finds? Um, what she found and excavated, she mostly sold and she sold them mostly to collectors and scientists and to some museums. Unfortunately at the time, um, most of the scientists were all male and they took what they, she gave them and took credit for it. So they would take her fossils and her information, write their own reports, do their own drawings, and give these things to museum collections under their own names without her involved at all. Um, a lot of times they tried to discredit her finds just because she was a woman because that wasn't done. Her work wasn't done by women at that point. So they would look for ways to kind of pull it apart. They weren't successful because she really was an expert and knew what she was doing. Um, the societies, the geological societies also would consult with her a lot, especially around the, her expertise in coprolites. 
um, and expertise in identification of fossil bits that were found, but they would not allow her to join their geologic societies. In fact, the Geological Society of London wouldn't admit any women until 1904, well after Mary's death. Um, she did die in 1847 of breast cancer and she died largely unknown. About 20 years after that, Charles Dickens published an article about her life that generated some interest and kind of started to get her name out there. And of course, now today, we recognize her for her work. Her finds are credited to her. Her research is credited to her. Um, and you'll find her um, fossils in museums around the world. And if you are so inspired by her and happen to have an opportunity to go to England, you can still go to the Jurassic Coast um, and look for your own fossils. Um, this is a picture from a town called Charmouth, which is right next to Lyme Regis, where Mary was born. And you can see the picture on the right is part of the cliffs. They're kind of taller, a little bit gold, and they're more solid in structure. And the picture on the left is uh, cliffs that are lower, wetter, softer, they're that black kind of soft material. That's where you'll find a lot of the fossils that you can get today. However, the cliffs are really, really unstable. They have lots of rock slides, lots of mudslides, so you have to use caution there. Every single storm erodes a little bit more, um, which is not great for the stability of the cliffs, but also exposes new layers that have been hidden for millennia. So who knows what you find there. Um, if you do go fossil hunting, you can't dig straight into the cliffs. You look on the beach for rocks. The most common thing you can find there are called ammonites. And the picture down on the bottom left is a digital reproduction of what an ammonite would have looked like in the Jurassic period. It's kind of a spiral shelled squid-like mollusk. Um, and you'll find those spiral shells um, a lot on the beach. They're all over the place. You find them by breaking into some rocks that have seams on them. So the picture on the right of the rock with the white line, you take a hammer and break into that to see what's in there. In this case, we didn't have to because the spiral is right on the outside. Um, picture on the bottom shows fragments that you can find or smaller spirals that you can find either just lying on the beach or through breaking rocks open. There are some other things there too. The top picture of my palm, you can just make out there's a fossil of a little fan shell there. So you can go there, you can find fossils all over the place and kind of channel your inner Mary Anning. So that's it for my fossil hunting and Mary Anning presentation. Thank you for listening. Here are some photo credits if you're so interested. And I'm going to hand it over to Michelle for her baseball presentation. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to catch a foul ball. And um, there's a lot of misnomers in that. So I'm going to go ahead and explain. And this is for everyone from, you know, seasoned baseball fans, anyone attending their first baseball game. Um, I'm a big baseball fan, and I have plenty of pictures along the way. And I actually have some non-baseball information for each one for those who might be a little bit more bored by the sports end of the discussion. First of all, just want to say a foul ball is a foul ball by the sense that um, when a baseball uh, game happens, uh, a ball that gets hit off a bat that goes into the stands that isn't in play. Um, this happens about 50 times per game, meaning there's about 50 foul balls going into the stands for fans to take home. Um, I also would include home run balls under this too, but you would only see a couple of those um, in any one game. Batting practice home run, I also call a foul ball. In, it's just in the sense of uh, getting to take one home. But a bat, batting practice is the time baseball players have before the game starts where they're just on the field practicing. And because of the nature of it, there, many home runs get hit at that time. And a player toss ball is just exactly that. Yeah, player tosses the ball over to the stands to you. And quick non-baseball fact, Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. There's also Cooperstown's home of the Fettermore Art Museum and the Farmers Museum, and you can get a museum pass, a discounted pass to go to all three of them. And James Fenimore Cooper is where Cooperstown did come from. So that's his art museum and his former house there. So a game caught foul, foul ball. Um, for everything, I always recommend bringing a glove. The next thing is don't be a fair weather fan. Some of the best times to walk away from a stadium with the ball are, are when both fair weather in the sense of the actual weather. Um, if it's a really bad day out, not as many people will be there. So you might have a better opportunity, but also 
if your team's really not doing well, um, people stop attending less, they're less interested, but you're still there. So again, you're one of the minority in the stands uh, at the time. Um, positioning is also really important because when you uh, have yourself into usually an intersection in the stands. So if you're in the bleachers and you have the end of the row or there's a terrace, you have a lot more mobility to try and get to a place where a ball might be hit. Um, I don't recommend, you know, being aggressive with it, but you could, you know, just have position yourself in a better place where you have better footing instead of being stuck just in your very small seating area. The Coors Field here is pretty interesting. When this uh, stadium was being built right in Denver, they actually discovered many dinosaur bones uh, at the time. And now their Rockies mascot, Dinger, is um, it's a triceratops because they found a uh, seven foot long, 1,000 pound triceratops skull during that time. So there's your non-baseball fact. A batting practice home run. So batting practice is a lot of fun. If you, you have to get to the game, or it's usually games, uh, gates open about two hours before the game starts. And if you get there early, you can get yourself again in one of those positions. It's kind of like a, kind of think of it casino. You know, you get there early, get up to a machine and, you know, don't, don't leave the area. You know, uh, the, the best places in the outfield, left field, right field, um, kind of have to take your pick, try and figure out how many left-handed and right-handed hitters there are to figure out what, what better place to go. For those of you who don't know, there's actually um, something called the batter's eye, dead center. It's usually a netted, painted uh, area, or in some cases, the fields have things like juniper, uh, different, uh, just any kind of grassy area. That's directly behind the pitcher, so it's easier for a batter to catch the ball coming out of the pitcher's hand without the distractions. Because of that batter's eye, it's hard for you to get, usually in most stadiums, from one side to the other side of the outfield without going around the entire stadium. So that's just a keep in mind if you're looking at, you know, when you have a right-handed batter, they're usually gonna hit home runs to left field. And when you have a right uh, left-handed batter, they're gonna hit it to right. So it's, it's the opposite. What? And the fun fact about Dodger Stadium is, it was built uh, around uh, with much of Disneyland in mind. The, the owner at the time was a big fan of Walt Disney and his structures. And you could see a little bit, even in this picture here in the outfield, the awnings are shaped uh, like the, some of the structures in Tomorrowland. So that's pretty fun. That's so cool. And let's see, player tossed ball. So, it's pretty cool to get a ball from a, directly from a player. Um, my best uh, ways to do that are to keep an eye on play and not just obviously where it's being hit, but when, when a, it might be between innings at the end of an inning, it might be the warmups between each inning. Players usually have a ball if it ends in the outfield, like the last out of the, the inning. Sometimes they'll toss it right into the stands at that point, but sometimes they could also run into the, dugout with the ball still in hand and if you're paying attention to others aren't they still have that ball and I, I there's been times where I just put my hands up and indicate hey toss me the ball and I've had balls thrown right to me so that's that's a great way to do it know all the players especially the lesser known players um because if you can if you know them by name if you can say something about them you know talk to them a little while they're practicing before a game you know, they're more likely to pay attention to you because they're like, oh, they're not paying attention to the superstar. And if you're a fan of the opponent, and that's a, that's a great thing, wear your gear, your uniform, your jersey, your hats, hang out by that team's dugout on, or their bullpen, which is where they warm up their pitchers before a game. And, you know, chat them up there too, because as they see you're standing out with their, their team's gear among all the uh, home team, they're likely to toss something to you as well. And let me see, I'm trying to think Angel Stadium right now. Uh, oh, just uh, just while you're in, in Los Angeles, I don't have anything specific about uh, the Angels, but definitely visit the Getty Art Museum. That is the, the highlight there. So I'll just conclude with a few additional pieces. Um, so I'm, I'm a long-term athlete and 
softball player. I'm very good with the glove and catching things barehanded. So I would usually position myself in more dangerous areas. Um, uh, for example, a 90 mile an hour pitch, it comes off the bat at about 110 miles an hour. So you need to be pretty on top of it. The new netting they're putting up at stadiums is awesome because it's protecting a lot of people from those really fast line drives and allowing people really to just battle for those looped foul balls that might come up straight in the air and you have plenty of time to prepare for them. In that way, especially, you don't have to have any experience. You know, you might just get lucky. A lot of times I have just getting a bounce off of something, it careens off of a, an awning, anything like that. But just, just a little thing to, you know, make sure you're careful. If you're there for a more family-centered day, just, you know, make sure you're in a location where you can take it easy, not have to worry about getting something drilled at you. Because um, it, it is, it, that's been happening a lot more lately and thankfully the stadiums are trying to correct that. But definitely in the outfield, uh, during batting practice, places like that are wonderful opportunities for you. And that's my presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. That was really great. I had no idea about the dinosaurs in um, Denver. That's so cool. Um, all right, so that's the, that's the end of today's pocket lecture. We're going to be back here next Wednesday, same time at 1230, and we'll have Chrissy doing a demonstration on how to make chocolate sauce, and I will be talking about um, a pair of 1920s um, expats called Gerald and Sarah Murphy who were involved in the literary and art scene in Paris and France. Um, so we hope you join then and if not be sure to keep an eye on our YouTube page where we'll be posting these videos. Thanks very much.